it's been said that Philippine theater has never hesitated to go to war. In times of political struggle, Filipino activists have used plays to express their vision for a better world and give the ordeals of the oppressed a place at center stage. To this day, shows like Black Box Productions, Decada 70, Petas A Game of Trolls, and Dula Ang UP's The Condiman Party have been staged and restaged, empowering younger audience to confront pressing social realities. You're watching TFM's Theater 101. I'm Nicole and this is Philippine Protest Theater Through the Decades. In this video, we look back at the roots of protest theater in Philippine history, how our nation's theater folks served as harbingers of hope, voices for the voiceless, and the citizens' conscience, even when censors tried their best to stifle them. Number 1. Seditious Place of the Philippine-American War In 1901, the Sedition Law was enacted under the Taft Commission, criminalizing the advocacy of Philippine independence. All protest art was considered a threat to American rule, but still, playwrights took their anti-American sentiments on stage, risking not just their own arrests but those of cast, crew, and audience members. Juan Matapang Cruz did exactly this in his play Hindi Ako Patay. It was about the love between karangalan, meaning honor, and tangulan, the defender, as they resisted the usurper Makamkam, who symbolized the American insular government. During a performance on May 8, 1903 in Malabon, a drunken American soldier hurled a beer bottle at the Katipunan flag prop, proceeding to tear the scenery apart. Crews and 10 of the play's actors were soon arrested. The renowned playwright Aurelio Tolentino also suffered nine imprisonments in his life, one of which was for staging of his equally patriotic play, Kahapon Ngayon at Bukas. While labeled seditious then, these works are actually recognized now as some of the first nationalist plays of the country, marking the advent of revolutionary drama. Number 2. Secret Messages in the Japanese Occupation American films were banned in Manila under Japanese rule, allowing live shows to take their place on the stages of movie theaters. With film actors transitioning to take roles in vaudeville shows, Filipino plays became highly in demand giving rise to what national artist Daisy Honteveros Avellana called the golden age of Philippine theater. These shows were presented on big-name Manila stages like those of the Teatro Zorilla, the Capitol Theater, and the Manila Metropolitan Theater. In fact, by 1941, there were already 40 theaters in Manila featuring Bodabil, that is, the local version of vaudeville that the Japanese permitted. However, the Japanese government supervised the strict censorship of scripts. Thus, protest symbolism could not be as obvious as those in the place of the American colonial period. Instead, stage shows carried more discreet messages of hope to those shaken by the war. New theater groups arose during this period, such as the Filipinas Review, named as a subtle reminder that the Philippines was and will always be for the Filipinos. Here, many stars of Philippine cinema like Rogelio de la Rosa and Norma Bianca Flor, started their entertainment careers. Theaters also served as message centers for guerrillas, where they could secretly meet with friends and supporters. If the Kampaitai or Japanese police entered the theater, a vocalist would suddenly go on stage mid-show to perform a signal song, alerting the rebels that they had to bolt. Number 3. Proletarian Theater Groups and the Tide of Nationalism the return of the American presence in the 40s restored the use of English in local theater. Western classics such as Shakespeare and Broadway ruled Philippine stages even after independence in 1946, turning theater into a bourgeois art appreciated only by the fluent upper-class minority. By the early 60s, many thespians acknowledged this problem and prompted a huge shift. While at first the Filipino tongue was labeled badui, by the end of the decade, it had become the language of the stage. Companies like PETA and playwrights like Rolando Tino started staging more original Filipino works and translations of Western plays. The rise of student activism also led to the formation of cultural groups like Panday Sining, Kintong Silahis, Tanghalang Bayan, and Samahang Kamanyang. They popularized proletarian theater devising spectacles from real-life experiences of oppression and exposing the injustices that hounded the era's political landscape. 
These groups were formed everywhere from basketball courts to churchyards and rice fields. Collectively, their plays were called Dulensangan, and they laid the groundwork for theater activism under Marcus's martial law regime. Number 4. Camouflaging Political Intent Under Martial Law Many cultural workers and political actors disappeared over the martial law era. Under Proclamation 1081, theater could, once again, not be as propagandistic as before. While some commercial theater troops stuck to harmless derzuelas, comedies, and musicals, there were activists who strove to resist indirectly through their art. They staged plays around history and tradition, depicting past issues that mirrored those of the dark present. For instance, Nicanor Chongson's Pilipinas circa 1907 was a politicizing spectacle disguised in an anti-American Christian play. UP Repertory's famed playwright Bonifacio Ilagan also used the cover of religion in Pagsambang Bayan. While the production structure was close to that of a real mass, it was filled with Bible quotations about truth, justice, and freedom, and more blatant criticism against the tyrannical Marcos administration. Not long after its opening night in 1977, its director Ben Cervantes was arrested. Ilagan was forced to go into hiding, then asked to submit the script to Camp Krame authorities. Meanwhile, Cervantes continued performing the play inside the Bikutan Detention Center with a cast of political detainees. Number 5. People's Theater in Visayas and Mindanao As performance activists grew louder with increasing human rights violations and the Aquino assassination, some left Manila to bring People's Theater to outlying regions. Former participants of PETA's Basic Integrated Theater Arts Workshop, or BITAO, relayed their knowledge in Davao, Nano del Norte, Negros, Leyte, and Samar. As Catholic parishes formed alliances with PETA, Militant priests in Mindanao would even encourage church-based community theater on religious holidays. Beta workshops were structured as three-day courses that empowered lesbians to stage the stories of exploitation. Father Carl Gaspar, a playwright and the founder of Mindanao Community Theater Network, was among its organizers. Although he was arrested twice for the protest plays he produced, he continued to write behind bars and even established a theater program for his fellow detainees in 1983. Meanwhile, thespians across the archipelago continued to experience harassment as regional theater blossomed. In Samar, for instance, members of the police intelligence chased actors around the stage during a Christmas play from Makabugwas Theater Group. And there you have it! These are the moments we know of from the 20th century that marked the birth of protest theater in the Philippines. In every decade, it has proven to be a powerful weapon, an art of resistance and emancipation that flourished when others tried to muzzle it. With their ingenuity and guts, these pioneering activists remind us to continue making noise on the stage of the nation. Over on TFM, we like giving you more of what you want. So hit that subscribe button and don't miss any theater-related content in and about the Philippines. Got your own Philippine theater fun facts to share? Or maybe you've got an idea for a theater-related video yourself? Leave a comment and let us know what you want to see next.